Today's speaker is Jack Barsky. That's the name that he was given by the KGB. I assume everybody here knows what the KGB is. And the KGB has two different types of spies. You've got your spies that are under diplomatic cover, typically embassy and consulate officials. And then you have your illegals, what are called illegals. And your illegals are the spies who live next door to you as Americans, and you have no idea that they're a spy. The last, I mean, there have been several caught over the years, not many. They're almost impossible to identify. But the last famous illegal spy that pretty much everybody in this room might remember was Rudolf Abel, who the FBI um, caught in the uh, 1950s. And Rudolf Abel was a KGB officer who uh, was a spy next door. He's a photographer living in Brooklyn. You might remember he was traded about 10 years later while he was in federal prison for Francis Gary Powers, the U-2 pilot who was shot down over the Soviet Union, uh, I think on May 1st, 1960. The thing that makes it, for me, especially interesting about Jack that you're going to hear about today is I'm a retired FBI agent, uh, for those who don't know. And three of my years was spent working the KGB in New York. And we had over 600 agents assigned just in New York City working the KGB. And I was assigned to the squad that's responsibility was for neutralizing the known KGB officers, i.e. the ones under diplomatic cover, and trying to find people like Jack Barsky. Jack Barsky was about as deep cover as you can find, and Jack got to New York in 1978, exactly the same year that I got to New York, when I transferred there to the very squad that was assigned to find guys like Jack. And I'm going to let Jack pick up the story. Jack is going to be meeting a friend of mine who uh, I went through new agents training with, a really uh, good guy who I was on the squad with in New York. My friend Pete made counterintelligence his entire career. And coincidentally, Pete, he transferred from New York to Philadelphia, uh, which was the office that had Jack's case when, they dis when the FBI discovered him. And he'll tell you about that. But P.D. had more to do with behind the scenes work in Jack's case, and Jack didn't know it until I told him. And Jack will be meeting P.D. sometime in the next few months. I've already talked to P.D. and they'll be getting together. So I think Jack is gonna learn a few things too about his case he didn't know. Jack, you're up. Thank you. Uh, so much for a short introduction, huh? <laughs> um, I'm hoping can you hear me? I'm hoping this works. Good. Uh, it's uh, one of the dichotomies of my life that I get to speak to a bunch of people just about my age who I used to hate. You used to be my enemies, and I know that every single one of you used to be, you were evil. We're talking about the Vietnam War, obviously. And in preparation of this meeting, as I was thinking about this situation, I, I remember my good friend, Mike. I met Mike, uh, he was a colleague of mine when I was in corporate, and Mike was a little bit odd. Every time you say to Mike, Mike, how are you doing? Fabulous. <laughs> Mike, how are you doing? I'm fabulous. And one day I said, Mike, you know, you're so full of it. You can't be fabulous every day. And then he told me the reason for being fabulous. He said, you know what? When you spend two years in the jungle in Vietnam, in a swamp, on your stomach, with bullets flying over your head, the rest of your life is just fabulous. <laughs> and uh, so it occurred to me that, you know, Mike is a really good friend. And it occurred to me that under different circumstances, I might have aimed at him and shot him. And he might have aimed at me and shot me. So when, when you look at life, and you look at your own life, there's two things that 
have the greatest influence with regard to your, your influence on others, on your family, on friends, and maybe perhaps on, on the world uh, at large, it is your own desire and the crowd that you hook up with. I hooked up with the wrong crowd, there's no doubt. Um, and it, the, the decisions that we make to uh, attach ourselves to a certain cause is usually made very early in life. And that's at a time when we are really not qualified to make that decision. So we need sort of gentle guidance. Well, I got guidance out of the wrong quarters, and you'll hear about this a little bit. And quite frankly, I've been in this country now for almost 40 years. I've been a citizen for three years. And obviously, as an ex-agent, I'm, I'm observing the world around me. And I am sad to say that we as a nation today are not doing a very good job giving guidance to our young people to make the right decision. Uh, I can't explain uh, the fact that more than 40% of the millennials think that socialism is a good idea. I can't explain this in any other way. We're not giving them good guidance. And what they think they, is a worthy cause that they might attach themselves to is eventually is going to destroy this country and possibly in the process take themselves down as well. Um, I don't have a good solution. I think we need somebody like uh, Abraham Lincoln to, to come and, and appear and lead this country in the right direction and maybe uh, joined with uh, uh, somebody like Reverend Billy Graham. I'm praying that might happen one day. Anyway, this is uh, not something that I normally talk about, uh, because, but this is a special group, and I just wanted to share my thoughts about it. And now we'll talk a little bit about, uh, you know, we'll get a little bit of action. Okay. Uh, celebration of the Russian Revolution that happened a little over 100 years ago. And uh, without that event, I wouldn't, A, not be on this world. I certainly wouldn't have uh, taken the path that I took. You know, this, and this kind of music and, and, and the pictures uh, still want me to, like, participate. It, it, it gives you this, this, this feeling like, you know, revolution. We want to go and get rid of the, bad, the bourgeois, the bad capitalists. You know, storm the Winter Palais. This is the revolutionaries. And... You know, this, this, this energized us. It, it, it's, it's the best of agate prop culture. And uh, just from pictures, this is Lenin. Lenin became my hero. I knew that Lenin was the best man who ever walked uh, the face of this earth. Uh, this uh, is uh, Trotsky, who was murdered by Stalin. But Lenin, Lenin, it was always Lenin, the man who sacrificed himself for the good of the world. <coughs> Not ever did it occur to me that that was the real Lenin, just as murderous and just as bad as his successor, Stalin. And so after uh, the revolution succeeded, he, he instituted what's called the Red Terror. And I'm trying to explain how the KGB came about. The Red Terror is something, I don't know if we have a, uh, do we have a, what's on the left, uh, it's Russian, it says death to the bourgeoisie, long live the Red Terror. The Red Terror fundamentally was uh, 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 designed to save the revolution, but it, uh, it, it degraded very quickly in uh, no due process, killing people who you don't like, who, uh, and families, and pulling them out of their apartments and shooting them dead on site. Uh, just because they may be enemies of the revolution. And, and thousands and thousands were killed. It was not as bad as under Stalin later on, but that's how it began. And Lenin hired himself, this guy, to, uh, to organize the killing. Felix Dzerzhinsky, a, a, a Polish nobleman who led the Cheka. The Cheka is the forerunner of the KGB. And there were a couple of other names associated with this, but this is... This guy, uh, Dzerzhinsky, was uh, and probably is revered by intelligence circles in, in the Soviet Union or even modern-day Russia. And now I'm going to uh, 
give you a quick uh, overview of what happened to the eight uh, successors of Jezinski, who died from a heart attack, uh, until 1953. It's 1923 to 53. So here we go. Menzinski. Uh, he died from angina. It was a tough job, you know, this, you know high pressure. Uh, <clears throat> this guy replaced him, and he was killed when he was replaced. This guy replaced that guy. He was killed when he was replaced. This is... Some of you might know this. He was killed. Uh, he was shot. Uh, he was shot. Now, this guy actually lived in, uh, uh, and died from natural causes. And the last guy prior to uh, the, the KGB becoming somewhat more civilized uh, died in a quote-unquote accident. He, he was found, found under a, a train. He, I don't know how that worked. So the point I'm trying to make here is not the entertainment value, but it's uh, none of that I knew or we knew when I joined the KGB, that this was an organization that pretty much ate itself from the inside. Such an organization and a country that is served by such an organization cannot sustain itself. And so it didn't. Uh, now after this guy, it got a little more civilized, and eventually we had this fellow, Yuri Andropov, who was the head of the KGB when I joined. He also became <clears throat> the president of uh, the Soviet Union for a little while, about, about a year. Um, and the very last of the head of the KGB tried to actually unseat the uh, Gorbachev, and Gorbachev's government, he tried to push this, this fellow here, no, he's not coming there. <clears throat> um, and they, tr they broke tradition. He was just, he wasn't executed when, when the putsch failed. Uh, this, this guy, um, uh, Yeltsin, <clears throat> uh, was very instrumental in, in actually making that putsch fail. He was, the, the last head of the KGB was just jailed. Uh, Yeltsin then became the president <clears throat> of the Soviet Union. And he didn't last very long. He, he drank himself to death, as you might remember. Uh, and he was asked in his last days about the, what was the biggest mistake you ever made in your life? He said, I made a lot. But the biggest one that I really regret is putting this guy in power. <laughs> That's what we got today. That's uh, our good friend Vladimir, with whom we're still struggling today. <clears throat> now, let me make a detour in, into my personal life. How, how do I fit into this picture that I drew you, like this, this, this history? And uh, <clears throat> it starts out in post-war Germany. I was born in 49. This is a map of uh, uh, the German occupation zone, uh, zones, zones after that was a German uh, flipped zone. Uh, the, the British, the French, the American, I'm assuming some of you might have actually had a tour in Germany, and, and the Soviet. And I was born right there, which today is the easternmost part, southeasternmost uh, easternmost part of uh, Germany. Uh, that fat little girl was me. It's, it's amazing. The question now becomes, and I want to tell you how this innocent little child uh, grows up and signs up with uh, this murderous band of, uh, of agents of, uh, in, in, in service of the communist cause to come to the United States to do some damage. So the first thing that I want to share with you, and I'm not going to read them all. I'm going to let this uh, slide stand for a little bit. Uh, this list of character traits was uh, uh, given to the world by an ex-head of the KGB who talked, who was interviewed once by a British newspaper, and he said, this is what we were looking for. And I'm looking at this list, and I pretty much fit that bill one by one. I particularly like this one, well-controlled inclination to adventure. Occasionally, that uh, inclination for adventure went out of control. 
my wife who is here, who can, if she can testify to that, I'm still doing a lot of stupid things that one shouldn't be doing. Uh, but that is sort of the kind of person that I became. <clears throat> There's one thing that's sort of missing or it's hidden under emotional stability that is hardness of the heart. And the KGB had a helper. That was my first girlfriend. Uh, I was, that was in high school, I was in love with her, I was going to get married to her. This was like, I mean, she was my world. And then when she went to college over there and I went to college over here, she wrote me this goodbye letter and I was totally, totally devastated. I mean, my life pretty much made no sense anymore, but I, I buried myself in my studies. I didn't look at uh, another girl for another three years. Uh, and I promised myself that the short, the, the four-letter word, L-O-V-E, would not be a big factor in my life. I would be looking out for myself. And I would have a career. I would have a good life. And if there were women in my life, uh, be for pleasure. But love, eh, that hurts too much. Um, so, uh, so I just established sort of the character that you need to become an a undercover agent. The motivation is another thing. Besides ideology, I'm going to just talk about uh, my personal interest. I always wanted to travel, and I wanted to have an adventurous life. I wanted to, have a, I wanted to be different. Uh, and I really like the idea of being able to break all kinds of laws in all kinds of countries, you know, to be special, so to speak. Uh, but not to underestimate is uh, <clears throat> ideology. And this is where it comes in where you sign up with a wrong crowd. We, let me, let me show you, this is an event that was very significant in the life of the, of people like me. I was four years old, it was when Stalin uh, died. This is the funeral. Thousands and thousands of people were were at this funeral, they were crying. Their hero had died. And this I listened to on the radio. This is Chopin's funeral march. This was on the radio, and the entire Eastern Bloc thought our God had just died. And oh, by the way, there were a few people in America when Uncle Joe died, they thought it was terrible. Uncle Joe was the biggest killer. Maybe he, he competed with Mao in the history of, of the world. But that was something that was sort of uh, uh, cemented, it was, it was implanted in, in my memory as, first, as a first childhood memory. And when we talk about ideology, this is a collection of youth organizations or, and, and party and uh, <coughs> uh, uh, the union and paramilitary organizations and the, the media, everything that you were, that you got uh, uh, with regard to ideology, with regard to philosophy, everything was one track only, and that was communism is the law that governs the, the development of human society. Communism is, will uh, eventually rule, and it will provide a sort of a paradise on earth for everybody. And therefore, we need to fight the evil capitalists that were represented by West Germany and, of course, its patron, the United States. And this is how we were absolutely convinced that this was right. Um, this is in, in 11th grade. High school students uh, in East Germany had to visit a concentration camp. And we saw not just pictures like that on the walls. We saw lampshades that were made out of human skin because uh, they were made for the, the wife of the commandant because the, uh, uh, the person who donated that skin had interesting tattoos. This lady would pick out the people from, from the arrival queue and said, I want this one, I want that one, I want that one. Shrunken heads and a whole bunch of other horrible things that when you were uh, at, at that uh, you know, tender age of 17, the girls all cried and, and the guys stopped talking. Now, here's the clincher. 
I have this picture of this fellow uh, side by side. This, is, this was the leader of the Communist Party in Germany, Ernst Hellmann. The Communist Party in the 30s, in the 20s, up until 33, when, when Hitler finally took over, was the only force that actively fought the brown stormtroopers in the streets. Nobody else. This is, this is uh, uh, admitted established history. Nobody else. Thermann was incarcerated, eventually wound up in Buchenwald in that concentration camp, and was killed uh, about four months prior to the end of the war. We, East Germany, was, we were led by the communists. That means we were in the tradition of Ernst Thermann who fought the Nazis. And Stalin defeated the Nazis. And, and then you had this guy. Uh, this is Reinhard Galen. He was the head of uh, military intelligence for, uh, under uh, Hitler. He not only got away scot-free, he was co-opted by the CIA. And eventually his entire group be, uh, was the core of what became the Bundesnachrichtendienst, that, that is the, uh, the West German intelligence, the equivalent of the CIA. Well, that case closed, right? We were on the right side of history. This, this was the old Nazis. They were supported by, uh, by, the, by the Americans. And then we had the Vietnam War, and we had the thing in Chile. And how could you not, based on what I knew about the world, how could you not want to join that cause and, and, and defeat that evil? Some of it was, I, I believe the Americans at CIA committed a very bad error here in tennis. We call it an unforced error by allowing this fellow to live and, and, and become the head of intelligence in West, West Germany. There was a, a huge propaganda laws. They were only interested in the intelligence. I was somewhat narrow-minded, I think. But anyway, so there we have um, somebody who was ready to rock and roll. I, got, uh, I was recruited by the KGB. I can't get too much into detail there. Uh, and uh, I wound up in, the, in, uh, in New York in 1978, one of the best trained agents that they ever sent. I had five years' worth of training. And now I'm going to let you in on a few little things about what it was like to be a spy. And when we were starting out uh, with my trip in 78 from Moscow to uh, New York, this was not your normal type tourism trip. You get on a plane, you go, you go from here to there. Now watch this one. Uh, I flew to what was then Yugoslavia, Belgrade. <clears throat> in Belgrade, I bought a ticket for an overnight train to Vienna, Austria. Now, um, I couldn't get a first class ticket, so I was sitting you know, in the economy, so to speak, with a bunch of uh, shady characters. And I was uh, warned by the KGB, he said, you know, in, Aust in, in, in Yugoslavia, to be careful, they're pickpockets. Well, I had ten thousand dollars in cash on me. That's the equivalent of about thirty-five today. That's a lot of money. And I had a one passport. It was a false passport. But any of a loss of any of those would have been the end of my career as a spy. So I, this was one heck of a, a stressful trip. I was sitting there, literally crouched over like that, and with my elbows close to my pockets here so nobody could reach in and was reading a book all night. I made it to Vienna. In Vienna, I met a, a local agent, uh, exchanged uh, one false German passport for another one, and took another train to Rome this time. In Rome, I, th this train ride was a little more pleasant. In, in Rome, I uh, met an agent, and I exchanged an German passport for a Canadian passport. You know, you see, every time you have a different passport, you have to remember who you are. You know, <laughs> what's your name? Where you come from? Where do you live? What's your job? When were you born? And on and on and on. So it, constantly you have to remind yourself of that in case somebody asks. So in, in this case, I wasn't, I, I didn't even change just, uh, you know, uh, this stuff, I also changed uh, nationalities and languages. So this is the only name I ever remember, uh, uh, because that's the name I entered the United States with. Uh, uh, it, um, uh, it was William Dyson. William Dyson 
was a Canadian citizen, obviously a false passport, who lived in Toronto. And we, with that passport, I flew to Madrid, uh, on to Mexico City, where I spent five days to, you know, uh, get rid of the uh, impact of the, the time difference. And then I went on to Chicago. I bought a ticket, actually, to go to Toronto, but it was a uh, stopover in Chicago. I deplaned in Chicago. And uh, that was the, the first night uh, in, on US soil. I made the worst mistakes, mistake in my entire career uh, that should have, could have uh, ended my, my career as an agent right then and there. Um, I had no clue what Chicago was like. Neither did anybody in the KGB. They didn't have representatives there. So when I, uh, I deplaned, I went, I got my, my, my suitcase <clears throat> and I hailed a taxi and I had looked, uh, looked up in uh, a hotel in the Yellow Pages and I had written it down. I, I told the fellow the address and he looked at me like, hmm, I had no idea what, what that was all about. Uh, it was like over here, there's all Peachtree Street, down there is all Wabash. This was all Wabash. So we... When he stopped at the destination, I started to get an inkling that this, uh, what that funny look was all about. But, you know, bravely as I, as I always acted, I would just go forward and never back. Uh, that hotel building looked a little bit old. I walk into the lobby and I had more of a funny feeling because the reception desk was uh, protected by plexiglass. <laughs> And there was a little slot in there where you put the money in and you get the key out. Um, I still didn't have a clue. I didn't really have a good frame of reference that this was unusual. Much later, I found out I was exactly in the center of the south side of Chicago. Uh, six, three, with my skin color, with at that point about $7,000 in cash. That was a dangerous situation to be in. I survived. Uh, that's why I'm here, right? Uh, anyway, here's uh, the means of communication. Uh, I had fundamentally two means of communi communication. Uh, I received uh, 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 communication from the center uh, via shortwave radio. This is actually the picture of the very same radio that I had on me. It was the most advanced shortwave radio that you could buy, but you could buy it in a store. There was no special agent equipment. And every uh, Thursday night at 9.15, I would turn to a particular frequency and hear something like this. Come on. And, and this is sort of like, this is one of the things, one of the sounds that will stick with me forever. It's just like, you do this for 10 years, it just becomes part of you. So I just want to turn that off. And, and all I ever got uh, it wasn't letters, it was numbers. It was an encrypted message that was decrypted with something like that. It's called a one-time pad. You, you take the numbers that you get and you either add or subtract depending upon whether you're sending or receiving uh, those numbers and eventually it becomes letters. And it took uh, for a medium-sized message at least a good two hours to decrypt. Sometimes uh, a long message uh, kept me up until like three in the morning. Uh, that wasn't always fun, particularly if the message started the following way. Dear comrade so-and-so, uh, we congratulate you on the occasion of the International Workers' Day, May 1st. I said, what are you doing? You're wasting my time. But they, they had this funny um, um, emotional uh, attachment to the revolution, to the motherland that I didn't have. And you know, I just wanted to get it over with anyway. Uh, and I uh, sent uh, my uh, information via a secret writing. I used a regular <coughs> uh, 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 notepad that was impregnated with a particular a chemical that uh, would eventually produce secret writing on an open letter that would be sent to some place either in South America or, uh, say, uh, Austria, uh, where a, a contributor to the uh, uh, volunteer to the KGB would hand it to a diplomat and it would go via a diplomatic pouch to the center. So the communication cycle, if I had a question, 
The answer would, have, would take about three weeks. Most of the time, that was too long. So I learned, and even today, my wife reminded me of that. I learned to do everything on myself, by myself. I learned to be completely independent. I learned to make my decisions on the spot. And uh, I had a pretty long career in corporate America. I got into management. But that kind of uh, feature, just going ahead and make decisions without asking everybody, that, that, that didn't work very well in corporate. Uh, that's why I didn't last more than four and a half years in every one of those jobs. Anyway, uh, and one other way to uh, hand over information or stuff that you can't uh, put in a mail or, or transmit via shortwave, things such as uh, uh, money, passport, or an uh, undeveloped uh, microfilm, we used a, what's called a dead drop operation. That's uh, you, you put whatever you want to hand over it into a container. You put that container in a predefined spot, and there's a very elaborate, uh, uh, very uh, exactly timed operation where you go, you place, you set a sign. The, the, next, the guy who reads the sign says it's there. He comes, takes it, sets another sign. And this picture over there is actually uh, of a tree. This used to be a tree, but that was like 35 years ago in Inwood Park in Manhattan. And I actually retrieved, uh, from down in that hole, I retrieved an, an oil, old oil can that uh, contained a passport and travel money because I, every two years I went back to Moscow for a debriefing and some, some rest and relaxation. So this is a few things about uh, you know, what it was like. Now, I'm taking you uh, into modern day Russia really quick. Uh, there are some misguided people who actually ask this question. Oh, no, this comes in the next one. So this is Russia of today. Uh, all of that red one, it's still by uh, size the largest country on the planet by far, except what's in here in the middle. You can't live in it. It's permafrost mostly. Uh, you, nothing grows really. Uh, the the viable part of Russia is here and then on the, on, in, in, in the Far East. But see, what used to be the Soviet Union, you see all these other colored uh, little countries, and that also includes the, the Baltics, that fell apart and that's not there anymore. And this is what uh, Putin regrets very much. He, he was quoted, the, the worst, the most tragic thing that ever happened in the 20th century was the, the collapse of the Soviet Union. They're still crying for it. The, the reason for that is when you look at the history of Russia, Russia has always been a highly aggressive nation. Uh, and for, for two reasons. They, needed, they wanted access to warm water uh, harbors, like the Caspian Sea, for instance, down here. They're all, because all of this stuff that surrounds them is all frozen. And the other one, more importantly, was they were always afraid of, they were always wanted to protect their borders because they were subject to the hordes from the south. And, and for the southern border particularly was very vulnerable. So the, the Russian czar, since the Middle Ages, always expanded the territory and eventually wound up with the Soviet Union. That was at the height of what, what you would call the Russian rule. But so now let's get to that question, is Russia a friend or foe? Uh, never was a friend, doubtful it ever will be. I wouldn't call it foe or enemy, but at least adversary. That's where we are today. And there's no doubt about it. And anybody who thinks that, that we can make nice, no. Uh, but we have to sort of coexist in some way for one reason and one reason only. They got nuclear weapons. They got half the nuclear arsenal still that we have in this world. They can blow up this earth many times over. And unfortunately, the problem is that they are also uh, associated with uh, rogue nations. And uh, at the fringes, there are terrorist groups that could possibly one day steal a few of those. That is where our common interest lies. Because the one thing that they're not, and they never were, is suicidal, thank God. So, but, and then the question comes up, and you know, I've been 
I've been on on CNN, MSNBC, and Fox many times as being asked, so what about do the Russian spy? <clears throat> do the chicken lay eggs? <laughs> uh, this is what happened to the KGB in, uh, after the Soviet Union fell apart. It, it, it sort of split into the FSB, which is the equivalent of the FBI, and the SVR is the equivalent of the CIA. And then we always had military intelligence. Now, when, how do you build an intelligence service from scratch? You don't. You take the cadre, you take the people who know how to operate, and, and you put them in the new, in the new organization. And my friends in the FBI will tell me that the methods, uh, other than technology, the methods that the, uh, uh, the FSB and the SVR use are pretty much the same that they used in my time. Well, it's the same people. Maybe not the same people uh, anymore, but it's the folks who were trained by the same people. And uh, here I need to... Uh, here I have a personal connection, and this is a pretty forcing one. These two fellows are Morris and Lana Cohen. They were American citizens, uh, members of the Communist Party, <clears throat> uh, recruited by the KGB, and very instrumental in the theft of the atomic secret. They were part of the uh, Rosenberg uh, loosely constructed spy ring, of which uh, uh, Colonel Abel was part as well. <clears throat> the reason I'm showing you them, number one, they, they trained me. I met both of them. Lovely people. Another case where these, I mean, I would, have, I would have trusted them with my money, with my children. They're just wonderful people. Another case where uh, a well-meaning individual hooks up with the wrong cause. But this is the reason they belong into this category. This is commemorative stamps issued in their honor. And they weren't issued by the Soviet Union. They were issued by the Russian Federation, and they also received a posthumous uh, 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 decoration, hero of the Russian Federation, not the Soviet Union. Enough said. It gets more interesting. This, this fellow, who was a spy spy, almost nobody knows him. He did a lot of black ops. He, he worked behind the scenes. He was present at the exchange of Abel and uh, Gary Powers. He, he lived a long life, and when he passed away about a year ago, this is what Putin had to say him, about him. Incredible person and true patriot. So clearly, there's no doubt in my mind that modern-day Russia sees its foundation in the communist uh, Soviet Union. They shed the communist ideology and replace it with nationalism. And that is why this country, until there's some kind of a change internally, will always be a very, very dangerous adversary we really need to deal with carefully because of the nukes. And lastly, you probably are aware of uh, uh, the undercover agents that were caught in 2010, mostly famous because of, of that pretty girl. Um, when I saw the FBI has a video <clears throat> of those um, um, two, uh, of those op in operation, and I'm looking at this, oh my god, they were. They were. They, they didn't even pass espionage 101. They were really, really poorly trained, but they keep on trying. And there's a good chance we we still have neighbors living here that are undercover agents uh, because of the the glitch and uh, uh, and me talking a little bit too much into in the introduction. I'm going to go fast. I don't think there ever was and there ever will be direct collusion. I think that's nonsense. I think the real problem is is the web, is the internet, and and, uh, and the Russians really trying to do what we are doing ourselves. That is, divide the country into uh, uh, different uh, uh, sections that hate each other, possibly more than we hate the real enemies that we have. And they're doing a really good job that and Putin is sitting back and say, every time a Democrat says something really nasty about Republicans and vice versa, he says, hey, it's working. This is called, this is called disinformation, what, what we call nowadays uh, uh, fake news. Uh, in, in intelligence language, it's called active measures. The KGB did that kind of stuff in the 30s and 40s and 50s. 
They used the media available to them in those days, the newspapers, radio, and then the TV. Now they're using the internet. It's still very much uh, active. So now I'm going to go really fast to this one because it's not super relevant. I just want to want to get to that picture. This is. Uh, People always ask me about the Americans and that story and if it's real. And all I can tell you, no, it's not really, but it's the best show that ever hit television because I was in it. <laughs> you, you, you see that? You see how I look like a real, real undercover agent right there, uh, dressed in, in 80s clothes. Um, that I was an extra on the, on the show, uh, and. Uh, Here's a scary little picture. I'm showing it just because I can. And, and be, but it was a scary. Uh, when you made the cover of the National Enquirer, that's me right there, together with Trump and Putin, you, you got it made, right? <laughs> when that came out, I was scared for about a week. I was scared more uh, than, than about many other things in my life, uh, simply because some Yahoo could have just looked, looked for me and maybe uh, taken his uh, justice in his own hands. And lastly, I just want to, um, this is disconnected, but it's part of my story. And I want to give you a hint about uh, the human aspect of this story and, and, uh, and the fact that love actually did creep back into my life and actually in a big way. Uh, we're talking about, we're looking at two presidents here. They have red telephones. What made me change my mind and actually defect and said goodbye to the uh, uh, to the KGB was somebody on a red telephone. That was Chelsea, my 18-month-old daughter. Uh, when I was called back, I couldn't leave her. This is who she is today. I'm really proud of her. She had three months, uh, three weeks ago, she uh, fe was featured on a, a production at A and E called uh, The Spy Who Raised Me. I'm so glad I stayed, and I'm so glad I stayed in this country, and I'm very, very happy to have landed here in Georgia. I should have moved a long time ago. Well, thanks for listening, and if I don't know if we have time for questions. I would... <laughs> Thank you very much. Do we have time for questions? It's a funny thing. When I I, I was featured, uh, uh, my life was featured in uh, 2015 on 60 Minutes, and subsequently I was approached by the producers of that show, and they invited me, and I got a grand tour, and they were so, they were giddy, and the reason they were giddy is that well, we came up with this idea that the FBI agent is the neighbor of of, of the undercover. Well, in my case, the FBI bought the house next to me, and there were a few other parallels. Uh, but to, to, to uh, so that's the, I became friends with them, so to speak. Uh, and I've told them many times, and they know it themselves, what they're producing has nothing to do with reality. It has the seeds of reality. For instance, sex espionage uh, that has been uh, part of espionage since the days of Rome and still is. So, but, but it's what they show is. Uh, Phenomenally exaggerated. Every every time I see these two undercover agents run around with wigs on them, I say, "Ooh, don't do that." <laughs> I mean, it's, there's a whole bunch of no-nos. This couple would have uh, fundamentally uh, a. They are superhuman. They 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 can uh, they do everything. Uh, they kill. They break locks. They I mean, they do everything. But the way they operated, they would have uh, blown their cover within about a month. The whole idea for us undercover agents, sleeper agents, was to blend in and not cause a stir, not uh, uh, um, bringing attention to oneself. Uh, to just give you an idea how extreme that was, headquarters, that means the center, uh, debated for a while as to whether they should send me or not because I'm too tall. I met a colleague of mine. He fits the description a whole lot better. One of the 10 that were sent over in, in the same time frame, he's about this tall, 
and you wouldn't notice him. When he steps into the room, he wasn't there. That was the, that was the perfect undercover agent. The center uh, was uh, right off Red Square in Moscow, uh, the Lubyanka. I don't know if it's still there. I, I was in that building once. It also contained a prison, by the way. Uh, uh, when I, by the time I was here, they moved a lot of their operations outside of Moscow into an area where you, you couldn't get anywhere near that area within a mile. And inside, and this is, I know this only because there was a fellow who spilled the beans who was actually one of the, uh, part, uh, part of that uh, bureaucracy. Inside, they lived a life of luxury. They had Western goods, they had a sauna, they had tennis courts, swimming pools, and all that stuff. And when I read that, I really got mad. Because, you know, they sent me over here uh, the first year in, uh, I, uh, uh, I lived in a crummy hotel room, and then I got my first job as a bike messenger in New York, and they lived a good life. I really hated them. Yeah, I, unlike uh, my, some of my uh, friends in Germany who were members of the Stasi East German uh, intelligence, who got hit with a two by four when the wall came down, I had a, I had a lot of time to decontaminate. Initi the, the decontamination started when I had my first job in a corporate setting. It was a MetLife. And the insurance companies uh, were, uh, we were told that the worst offenders in capitalism was insurance and banking and the military industrial complex. So, you know, I, I get a job as a programmer at MetLife and I was still looking for the evil capitalists. You know, my bosses were nice to me. We got free lunch. They paid me well. I had wonderful colleagues. So that, that wasn't quite true. And so I slowly moved from, you know, extreme communism to something like a socialist attitude, sort of what they have in, in some countries in Western Europe. They call it a market, a, uh, I forgot what the, but it's a, a uh, there's a lot of state-supported uh, uh, stuff going on in those countries. Not like, you know, not, not, capitalism is very much regulated there. But anyway, so I went in that direction, and then the wall came down. And I said, whoa, I, was, I had no idea. And I started investigating. And in those days, the internet was available. And I found out that stuff about Lenin and the Russian Revolution and Stalin and the Stasi, and, I, and slowly but surely, I use the word to myself that I can't use here because my <laughs> I said, oh my Lord, I served the wrong cause. And then in 1997, the FBI finally found me. And they needed a little help. They weren't as good by themselves. They needed a defector. And uh, so I got debriefed over a long period of time. I became friends uh, with a fellow who led the investigation, Joe Riley. He wrote the afterword for my book. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm now not at a point where I say this is a perfect country. There is no such thing as a perfect country. There is no such thing as a perfect human being. But... I'd rather be here than any place else because we have something here and we still have it that I don't think is available anywhere else in the world and that's called freedom.